What's the, the challenge of BIM implementation might be my, my first piece. Uh, we broadly, we know what we're doing. We've got a, a standards and things like that. And, and, and what is it that, that the real things that we need to do? Uh, now, from my perspective, this is the way that my organisation, uh, um, sort of Arcadis, looks at BIM. You see it's quite, even though we're a European business, it's very influenced by the level one, level two, level three concept. First thing that tells you is that the messages that we've been talking about in the UK have gone beyond UK borders. To put that into a sort of wider context, here's a sort of like a strategic model of what a BIM implementation might look like. And the first thing you need to have is a vision and strategy. So that's a pretty obvious one there. Um, you also then, and that needs to be embedded into some kind of project process. So here we've got a process here that goes through planning, creating, operating and redefined assets. So the strategy actually relates to an organisation, how it operates around its entire asset life cycle. You need to think about information requirements and models and standards. So there's a whole lot of commons of work that needs to be in place as an infrastructure to enable this work to be done. You then need to have a set of um, roles and training in place so people know what they've got to do uh, and uh, people who aren't necessarily BIM experts at least are aware of what's going on in their organisation. And then you need some technology, common data environments. There's a complex set of moves in parts and I have to say that actually again without plugging too much and the work we've done around standards and such like has really supported that and finally well, we can't of course forget continuous improvement. Now setting out on this journey of best practice uh, there's a whole lot of help that's being done. Now uh, level two uh, is the area where we're all at at the moment so government is moving into its second stage of mandate which is saying it now needs to be able to have the capability to ask its contractors and its suppliers to validate and verify the information that they're providing. So we're, we're into a second stage of development. And the essentials that I want to focus on are what you might describe as the seven things that you need to deliver level BIM. So I'm lifting up a bit above the standards, but I hope I'm going to show you how the standards contribute to these. So the first one is being able to say what information you need. The second one is how that information is communicated, models, I'll explain what those are. Then the idea of, well, how do you make sure you're getting information out of the models? Is these things called plain language questions? And then the mechanisms which you use to exchange information. Common data environment, standard methods and procedures, and the execution plan and toolkit. So, and I'm going to do this at two levels. I'm going to do, the first thing is to try and explain what these things are and then just very high level um, canter through some of the detail. And I'm not going to do much detail, I'm just going to highlight the component parts. So my view of the reason why information requirements are important is it actually enables the client to define how they're going to get value from the project from data. So the client becomes empowered and that's quite rare in projects actually. Usually they're sort of, they're, they're, they're sort of being told what they need to do by, um, uh, by, by their teams. But of course this creates a, an element of responsibility. Now you'll see that there's a, a series of standards there, PAS 1192, 2, 3 and 5 that support that. And there are three key sort of areas of work. Organisational information requirements, the things that say we need this kind of information, let's say asset performance, so we can run our entire portfolio. So if we don't have this, we don't know what's going on. We have asset information requirements, so I know what the planned preventative maintenance schedule is for this new building that I'm producing. And the employment information requirement, information requirements are saying, this is what I need today, or I need in three weeks' time to be able to make the decisions that I'm required to do on this project. So that's quite a lot of information, uh, which means that clients need to become increasingly uh, infocentric. The second one is this business of an asset information model. It sounds very complicated, but in, in, fact, in fact, it's just a term to describe all the relevant information and data in a managed environment. That means letters, drawings, PDFs, as well as BIM models. So it's not just BIM, it's everything. But the idea that we manage everything in a structured way. So if we go all the way back to 1109 to 2007, that was about managing all information in a structured way so people know what they should use. And so the highlights there, it's everything. It's in a managed repository. It's not just BIM models, it's all of this other data, which might be asset and asset condition data, performance data, so it goes well beyond the construction phase. 
and it's facilitated by a, a few key elements there that are embedded within the PAS. And I'd particularly highlight there this thing, these two acronyms, MIDIP and TIDIP, Master Information Delivery Plan, Task Information Delivery Plan. There you start to get the sense of people knowing what they've got to do before they do it, which of course is a, a classic thing that construction is ever so good at. Then plain language questions. So the idea of, well, I've got this data, what do I do with it? Now, if I was going to go onto Google now and say, how do I, when's the next train going from NEC to London? Now, I wouldn't have to say, get me this pixel from this website in this location to do it. Magically, the, the cloud comes with uh, that information. And plain language questions are a bit like that. So rather than saying, when's the next train to Houston, somebody be starting saying, is my project actually going to meet its regulatory requirements? And what you really want is you want to unleash the magic of, of data and the cleverness of all these data scientists to come up with the tools which do that. Now, if you can do all of these tools, can I don't know, snoop into my house, work out what kind of food I'm going to eat next week, uh, understand my preferences in terms of, I don't know, buying stuff from Amazon, then surely we can do this for construction which represents 8 to 10% of GDP. So the idea of plain language questions is not necessarily we've got it all sorted out now, but we're creating the structure by which we start to use data, setting a route going towards level three. So what we've got there is the idea of a purpose for data and then structured data that's going to give that answer. So the idea is we're creating a sense of that we're helping construction industry create its own data set. So we define the requirements, I've described one at the moment, does it comply with regulations? And then you'd expect the, the data to start demonstrating that these conditions have been met. You start to set really easy questions, like for example, does it comply with um, uh, sort of uh, building regulations uh, part M, which would say, can we check that all switches at the right height above floor level so they comply with um, accessibility requirements? That would be an easy one. The hard one would be something like, um, would be something like, does this meet our brief? That's a very fuzzy question, but you could start to use data to support that. So then you can start to see relationships uh, between various different parts of the information we're asking for. So you can see there, you've got what I've described earlier, three sets of information requirements in the middle. Uh, organizational asset and employer's requirements, so that information comes in. You've got a set of models. You've got our asset information model and our project information model, so that information's feeding through, and they're all supporting uh, the, the delivery of these plain language questions. So it all starts to join up in the sense of the reason we're asking those questions is to drive information into those models. The next one is a common data environment. Everybody talks about them, some are even delivering them. And I'd say this is a, it's not just an electronic filing system, it's a workspace and process. So it involves workflow to enable people to collaborate effectively. So it's very, very important defined in the two passes there. And the things I describe is firstly, it is a, it's a shared environment, so it could be a project collaboration site. So things like a site have got, peer, uh, have got CDE capability. Uh, the data is owned in accordance with the contracts. So it doesn't mean that people have to give away their data in ways that they don't intend to. And similarly, the collaborative use of data is managed in accordance with the way the project is set up. So the idea is you only give data data to people when it's ready. Now, without these kind of systems, nightmares can happen. I have an example within our office, not that anything we were responsible for, of a effectively a CAD sketch of a curtain walling system was used as a production model on a very large tower project in the Middle East. So just imagine what happens when these models finally get delivered on site and you find that actually the information on which was used for fabrication was not the current design information. Disaster follows. So that's why the sort of workflows within common data environment are so important, and why this kind of idea, this structure that's been in place for nearly 10 years, the idea that you go from work in progress to shared, to published, to archived, so everybody knows the status of their information is so important. This isn't BIM, it's not rocket science, it's just basic, uh, basic information management. 
but it's something that our industry doesn't do very well. So it's something which we, we can uh, move forward on. Then the three other last essentials for me are firstly standards and methods and procedures, a big component part of the PAS and the BS. So these are the common ways of working that teams need to put in place for collaboration. And there's lots of them listed out there and I don't intend to go through them but you'll have the slides. But it seems like standard file formats, standard ways of naming things. And uh, just as an example of this, we've recently been producing um, a set of guidance for BIM. So you can imagine we've got dozens and dozens of various sort of revisions of these different documents, 10, um, 10 chapters, moving all around a Dropbox format. And we've used these naming conventions and revision versions to manage that, and it's worked really well. So even in practice, we know that this is something that's worthwhile. An execution plan, not only so people know what they've got to do, but so they can demonstrate to their clients that they know that they're what they're going to do whilst they're being procured. So it becomes a sales tool as much as a management tool. But to demonstrate that the client's expectations have been met. So there in terms of things about roles and responsibilities, who's going to do what within our very complex supply chains, common procedures for things like clash detection. So all of the complex stuff which we do, and we know create a lot of problems around how much data is generated through clash detection can be determined through this kind of planning process. Now I just want to finish off by saying where level three is going to take us, which is where BSI are already starting to do this development work around where the standards should be. And I'm going to do this at a very high level, I don't want us to get into detail. What we're currently doing is we're trying to work on a sort of creation of a hierarchy of data for different purposes. So we're creating the construction data that enables us to build things, then the management data that enables to maintain these assets, and then the performance data that tells us whether a whole network of things, whether they're houses, um, uh, transport assets, are performing as they should do. We're putting in more emphasis on operations because we know most of the spend is on operations. Once you've built it, about 80% of expenditure is actually on either operating or occupying assets, so that's where the real savings are. And then we want to start to integrate across portfolios. So the whole smart city agenda is about how you make water, transport, power, and all these things start to work together. So whilst Level 2 BIM isn't doing all of these things directly, it's creating effectively the infrastructure by which way this information is exchanged. And the way that's going to emerge is that we're creating markets for what you describe as data analytics. So we know that transport for London, probably some transport for Greater Manchester and North, is creating these markets for information where people will use data, availability of buses, trams and such like, to sell services and create other information. So we'll see more and more of that coming through construction. And where we want to take level three to is the next area, which is performance which you'll remember in my post-Brexit speech this morning, I was talking about is where the whole construction industry needs to go to. Now, performance is all round us. Um, here's a bit of performance. Uh, this is actually me on a bicycle. Uh, so, and and uh, just modified off my mobile phone and basically saying we've all got this kind of data. It's been generated by everything we do, buses, cars, everything. So it's all around us. And construction isn't doing very well with this. So what we want to do is we want to take level three into data and performance. So the first thing is information management goes beyond capital and operations actually into the way an asset is performing and how people are doing. So you start to think about internet of things and such. Secondly, we want to use that performance data to optimize operation. So does that mean about predictive analytics around, for example, how, um, whether trains will operate, whether they need maintenance? The cross-rail trains, which will be introduced over the next two or three years, have almost completely automatic performance analytics. They'll maintain themselves rather than mean need to be maintained by people, which is how that particular provider won the bid on the basis of life cycle costs. So we're moving into that space, and then we want to feed back that information into design and assembly. So how do you make a school better? You make a school better by understanding, for example, the relationship between carbon dioxide and concentrations in the schoolroom and how the kids performed and how aware they were. So it's that idea of those kind of analytics which start to influence decisions. So our destination 
for level three is effectively smart infrastructure. It's stuff that works more smartly and it hopefully it makes us more productive as well. So to wrap up, what are my takeaways for any organisation thinking about BIM, how they need to respond to it? And these are the things that I need to think about myself every day. Uh, first thing is, we all need to understand our journey. Whether we are a standards organisation, a client, a consultant, subcontractor, whatever. We need to think about what our journey is and what our business as usual currently is and what it needs to be in the future. It's going back to the point I made earlier about Google and construction. We can't find ourselves in the same situation in 18 years time having done no more than we are now. It's not possible. We can't do it. So the second one is we need to make this shift between thinking about objects, stuff, component parts, to being infocentric, which is what, what data is connected to those, those objects, that stuff. What can we get from it to make it talk to one another, uh, to be able to make smart decisions in connection with it. We do need to reflect on the role of tools and standards because they say, actually, if we don't use them, we will be that set of cats uh, which you can't hurt. We'll have everybody doing their own thing and we know that doesn't work. We know from using this PowerPoint, we've had three or four different PowerPoints, they've all worked on a single platform because they've used a common standard. So that is a very important part of that. And uh, we also just need to reflect that it will be employer-led, uh, but it will be supplier-enabled. So nobody gets away from this scot-free. We've all got to do something on it. And my final bit, and I would say this as a consultant, is that we have to treat this as an ongoing change program. It's not going to stay still at any point. I'll be moving on to level three in about four weeks' time, and then no doubt I'll be moving on to level three and a half or something like that. So this is just part of our business as usual, is change. It's a cliche, but it's true, and it's one which we'll need to uh, keep moving around.